everyone and welcome to a new episode of Mish Strategies Middle Games Show. This is a Thursday where once again Miss Strategy and Miss Tactics will be together. So after my show, Miss Tactics will be here streaming as well. So you should get used to this Thursdays, the Mrs. Days, Miss Strategy and Miss Tactics. So stay here when my, once my show is over Miss, Tra Miss Tactics will take over and Miss Strategy. It's good to know my name. So at half past five Central European time, Miss Tactics will be streaming on Chess24. You do not want to miss this. Our topic is converting advantages. Let me bring up the board so it looks nicer. Chessboard! Last week and the previous sessions, we were discussing material imbalances. And today's topic is basically the continuation of that. So all these titles, material imbalances, converting advantages, they are all about similar topics. If you missed those previous sessions, please take a look at them on YouTube because you might need that knowledge for further sessions. So we discussed, for instance, in the material imbalances number two, how is it to play with an exchange down? And we examined Petrosian's games because he is super famous for his exchange sacrifices. He, he was the world champion that his trademark was the exchange sacrifice and for a positional reason. So we didn't see exchange sacrifices for the sake of giving mate. No, all he had for the exchange uh, that he sacrificed was a positional compensation. So all these sessions are about whether the material you have up or down is enough, whether your advantage, your material advantage is winning or by sacrificing material, you are actually having enough compensation. Today, as the title suggests, we will have material advantage and our opponent will try to compensate for it. That is, today we will see games where we have a piece up and the opponent will have two, three, or even four pawns for the piece. And we shall know how to win those games because just because we have an extra piece, the opponent will not resign. Let me just check in the chat that everything is going fine. Sometimes I forget about the microphone and sometimes there's an echo. So I think everything is all right. Oh, I see Easy Rider 27 is suggesting a new show that would be about how not to blunder. Well, uh, I can try to do that as well. Uh, anything you want to know, any topics, please suggest them uh, here in the chat on chess24.com or in the comments on YouTube, under the video on YouTube. Hello to everybody, hello to Fuxia, to the Drunken Lawyer, Easy Rider 27 Gross Mino, uh, and so many of you are here, I wish I could scroll down and say everybody's name, Simba7, hello. Uh, Lack Moving is also here, so converting advantages, peace versus pawns, that's our today's topic. We will have a piece, the opponent will have pawns, Will that be enough? That's what we shall see. First game on the board, you already saw the names. Kasim Janov, former world champion against Radoslav Gajek. So we are playing with the white pieces. You know Kasim Janov very well. I'm sure about that. You, you might have seen videos by Mr. Kasim Janov here on Chess24. If you miss them, you should check them out. He's a great author and you should learn a lot from him also because of this game where we will skip the opening as usual and what i want to show you please do not mind that we don't mention these moves we want to focus on this position after e4 so e4 is a really good move and the point of e4 is that it wants to undermine the c4 square where this knight is so you, you see that black has an outpost on c4, that's a great square for the knight, but by pushing e4, Kasim Janov is undermining this square. Of course, black is not forced to take, but if you don't take, then you will have problems with the d5 pawn. It will be an isolated weak pawn that will be difficult to protect. So black decided to capture this pawn. And in this position, instead of taking back on e4, Rustam played bishop f1 and that's the strongest move in this position and suddenly you realize that this knight on c4 that used to be an outpost that used to be a super strong knight is suddenly a piece in the air 
what is white threat in this position? I think I will not even bring up the time to think because I'm sure that you realize that the threat is b5. I can't make that move because it's black to move, but if we can push b5, either the bishop takes it or the bishop moves away, but in the end, the c4 knight will be hanging and there's no way to prevent it. For instance, queen d7 would fail for the same reason, b5, and then the knight is captured because after capturing with the knight from c3, suddenly the queen is attacking also the knight on c4. Yes, you could think about moves like c6 and such, but believe me, this position is already unpleasant. So black decides to give up the knight for three pawns. He takes on a3 and then takes on f1 and then on b4. So in this position, he's got his three pawns. Yeah, but the e4 pawn was hanging. Actually, he ends up having only two pawns which basically is never enough unless you have your pawns very advanced. So imagine you have only two pawns for the piece, but those pawns are here. If your pawns are that advanced, yes, it can composite even for a rook or even for a queen, but that's a very rare case. Normally you will need at least three pawns to compensate for a piece. This is clearly not the case. This is clearly a case where white is winning. So we will see how to play in order to convert this advantage into a full point very efficiently because I believe we can win this position but maybe it will take us forever unless we follow some guidelines that we will learn today. So after this move and after we have uh, we have managed to win a piece we shall regroup our pieces because often when you take a piece your pieces will suddenly be a bit um, out of control. They won't be in harmony with the position. When we just make normal moves, we develop our pieces, we develop, something happens, something tactical happens in the position. Oftentimes it happens that you will have a piece that's um, on the edge of the board. You will have a queen that's not so active. You will have a rook that's not connected with the other rook. In this position, it doesn't look bad, but it's also not ideal. It's not ideal because you will see that Black starts to bring his heavy pieces to the B file and you have a knight on B3. So you will have to deal with this pin on the B file. Of course, it's not so difficult to deal with it, but you must do something about it, which is knight D2. And after you have dealt with this and you drop the pawn, so now black has three pawns for the piece, you once again need to think, all right, I did not lose the knight on B3, but the knight is not all right on d2 either. So you have to keep moving with the knight. You exchange a, a pair of rooks because trading in general is something that favors the person with material advantage. I'm sure that you, you understand that. I'm sure that you know that. So all you need to do after trading the right pieces is to optimize the place where you piece your, where your pieces are. So the knight was not all right on b3 and it was not all right on d2. You need to find a safer square for the knight, which is in this case, the f3 square. And after queen d5, having in mind that you can also attack once you have your pieces in the correct squares, the queen is taking away the h7 square and now you bring your rook to the d5. That will be back rank mate. This is how easy it is. We are not winning on the spot, don't worry because rook c4 saves the day. So it's a counter attack attacking our queen. We will take a queen, he takes our queen. Do we want to trade queens or we do not want to trade queens? This is the first question of the day. So please let me know what would you play here? There's nothing tactical going on. You can calculate whatever you wish, but in general, do tell me, do you want to trade queens or you want to keep the queens on the board? Let me see if I have the beautiful, oh, where's my board? Where's the time to think? I did not want to make the board disappear. I want to make myself disappear. Ooh, that's not the right way. Let's make it bigger. Mm -hmm.
All right, let's discuss this. You might think that by keeping the queens on the board, you are winning on the spot. So let's examine that move first. We could keep the queen on b1 and that it might look like winning on the spot. So the black queen is still hanging and we keep an eye on this diagonal, which means that if the black queen moves, it's made in one, rook d8, and we have just won the game. Uh, so what's going on here? He has to give up his queen for the rook. That's a queen up that's still winning. Well, there's a move that saves the day for black. Let's think about that. You guys are so quick. I've just put up the time to think and the solution was already in the chat. Well done, everybody. It is Rook B4. That is a beautiful move. So you should always look for the best moves by the opponent. That is a hanging piece, right? But if we capture the Rook, our Rook will be hanging too. So yeah, Rook B4 saves the day for Black. And if we go back to c2, you know what happens, rook c4, and then once again, rook b4. We are not winning by keeping the queens on the board. Yes, you can go after, don't repeat three times, because the opponent will claim the draw, just repeat two times if you want to repeat. You can also go to b3, uh, but in general, I want to recommend you that unless you are launching a brilliant mating attack against the opponent's king. Uh, so unless it's a position where the opponent's king is extremely weak, if it's not that case, then do trade queens. Now, why I'm saying that is that you get used to the fact that if you have material advantage, whether it's a piece for some pawns, whether it's an exchange up, if you have something extra on the board, even if it's just a single pawn, Usually, it's easier to convert your material advantage if you have less pieces on the board. Just imagine a scenario where you have a pawn up, you trade everything and you end up playing a king and pawn end game where you have an extra pawn. It's likely that you will win the game. But if you have a pawn up and the position is full of pieces, you can even lose. I'm not saying that you should trade like crazy and trade every piece. Remember that always when you offer a trade of pieces, it should be about pieces that are equally valuable, not only meaning that you exchange a rook for a rook, I also mean that you exchange an active piece for an active piece. Don't exchange your active piece for a passive piece. So that is something to have in mind. Trade in general, but only pieces that are equally active or if the opponent's piece is more active, then get rid of it. So we trade queens. Not this line, but the game went on with rook d1, rook c4, and rook takes d5. So I saw in the chat that some of you were saying that black has lots of pawns, and that is true. Look at this position optically. It doesn't look that bad for black because as white, we only have three pawns. So imagine, imagine if the opponent gets rid of all our pawns. That's something you should be worried about. So yes, trades are good in general, but trade of pieces. If you trade pawns, you will end up having no pawns. And rook and knight versus a rook is not winning. Unless your opponent blunders, you will not win rook and knight against a rook. So make sure that while you are trading pieces, you have to keep the pawns on the board without pawns you will not win these end games so that's the second thing to have in mind trade in general but trade pieces and keep as many pawns on the board as possible now i was talking about those three black pawns it looks like it could compensate because black has th uh, three pawns two of them are past pawns but right now we can pick up one of them so that is something that's cool. And also one factor that is very important is not only about the quantity of the pawns, but the quality of the pawns. So the more advanced the past pawns, the worse it is for us. If you see a past pawn on c7, that's not scary. If you see a past pawn on c2, uh, that is scary. So if your opponent's pawns are not advanced, then you should 
relax. It doesn't mean you have all the time in the world because look at that pawn, it's running. So why we take a pawn on a7? This pawn can be running, but if it keeps on advancing, you shall make sure that you will take care of this pawn. So you should always do something and prevent that the opponent can just simply advance his pawn and create counterplay by threatening to promote his pawn. What happened in the game after rook takes a7 was f6. And in this position, a very important question. You've got a great, a very well placed rook. I did not want to move the rook, I wanted to draw, but I don't manage draw. So it's in the seventh rank. Where else could it be better? You can always place it behind the opponent's past pawn to make it a Taurus rook, and that is something important too. But this is just your rook. You have another piece, you have a knight on f3 that is not doing much, and it's it's a piece that we would love to bring into play. So Black did not push his pawn because he wants to control the C uh, with the C pawn, the D4 square. He does not want you to jump to d4 with the knight. Um, that means that you need to find out how you can activate this knight. What would you do in order to bring your knight into the game? You have a very well placed rook that can end up on c7, on e7, but right now I would like you to bring your other piece as well into the game. How do we activate the knight in this position? Well, I'm so impressed because several of you have guessed the correct solution and it was not easy at all. You might have thought about moves like bringing the knight from the root that seems to be the only one, knight h4, but this is not the correct one because um, where are we heading actually with this knight? The opponent's dangerous pass pawn is the c pawn. Yes, if we could give mate to the g8 king, that is all right, but how do we do that? So if black goes in this position, g5, um, we have managed to activate the knight, but is it really active? It's basically trapped behind the opponent's pawns. So careful with the knight jumps unless you see a way out. We will not lose the knight, of course, you have this check and such, but the knight is still not doing much, even if it looks like we are threatening the black king. This piece on g6 is not the best. It isn't what we want. We want to avoid that black will cause us trouble with this C past pawn. So a very important move suggested by many of you. Thanks everyone for being such an amazing audience. Rook C7 is an important move for two reasons. The first one already mentioned, the Tarosh Rook. So when the opponent has a past pawn, you want to place your Rook behind the pawn that means that he with his rook he cannot abandon the c file and if he cannot abandon the c file after pushing the pawn towards uh, the promotion square what will he do he will always have his rook stuck underneath his pawn you will place your king on g2 so then there are no checks no tricks and uh, 
simply he will not be able to move his pawn at some point because he's got his rook stuck underneath the pawn. That is so important in any endgame with rooks on the board, especially rook endgames. Tarash rook, you want your rook behind the passed pawn and you want the opponent's rook to be stuck underneath his own pawn. So you have an active rook, he has a passive one. But this move has a second reason why this is such a strong move. Rook c7 is preparing us for knight d4. That's the move we wanted to accomplish. We wanted to jump to d4 with the knight and we couldn't because the c5 pawn was not allowing us. Rook c7 pins the pawn and prepares the knight jump to d4. It doesn't matter that the opponent can give us a check, it is still a pin. And whether the e6 pawn drops or we simply manage to jump to e6 or f5, but in this position I would go to e6 because you are creating a double attack. Both the c5 pawn and the g7 pawns are hanging, so this is a position that's completely lost because you will basically take all the black pawns. Now, you might think that if black spots this move, the threat of knight d4 in time, he could have played e5, but in that case, he has given up another square that's great for the knight, and now we would go towards the king side. So after knight h4, it's not about knight g6 anymore, but jumping to f5. Remember how important the f5 square is for the knight? If you jump to f5 with the knight, it is a very dangerous attack. Even if you don't give mate, you just take the g7 pawn, you take the h6 pawn, then you go back to take care of the c pawn. Even if you don't win the c pawn, just keeping your opponent's rook underneath his passed pawn, being stuck underneath his passed pawn, that means that he will be paralyzed and you create an h pawn, an h passed pawn, and win the game with a piece up. So that is the recipe. But what we have learned from this game was that. First of all, sometimes the moment when you win a piece, your pieces will be a bit clumsy. It, they might not be on the ideal square. You need to take time to reorganize them. Don't be afraid of bringing back your pieces. This queen was on e4 and you make a retreating move, queen c2. Then you had to move the knight to d2. These moves look passive. You might feel like you're making passive moves for a couple of, uh, for two, three, five moves, but it's for a reason. It's because you are regrouping your pieces for creating a more ideal position. So remember that you will most likely need to regroup your pieces. You need a great plan. You need to know how you want to place your pieces. Secondly, trades are always, almost always good for you, but trades of pieces. Do not trade pawns because if your opponent has more pawns uh, for the piece, so he has got two, three, four pawns for the piece, and if he manages to exchange all your pawns, then he is the only one who can win the game in the end because a single knight will never win the game. A rook and knight versus a rook is also not winning. So careful about exchanging pawns, do exchange pieces. And uh, yes, these were the guidelines from this game, but we have several more positions to check. So let's jump right in with the other positions because it's important that we observe the other games as well. This is the French defense. You know that this is my favorite opening, but I'm not talking about the opening here. Only I want to mention that this is a line where black sacrifices a piece for three pawns. So this is theory. Some of you might like the piece, some of you might think that this is good for black. This is a complicated position and if people play it, it's because it's a mess. So it's not winning, it's not losing, it's a mess. Three pawns for the piece. One of the first games, by the way, <laughs> that was played in this variation was played by Lajos Portis, my compatriot and Hungarian Olympic champion, gold winner. So this is a line that was interesting and I think it's still interesting. You see that black has three pawns for the piece and also, as I mentioned, at the moment of winning material sometimes or oftentimes, you will end up having clumsy pieces. So this knight of course is not ideal on a4. I want to color it red. Yeah, now better. The knight on a4 is not ideal. Also, this d2 knight, well, you had to place it there because 
you had to prevent the check somehow, but the king is still stuck in the middle of the board and you are underdeveloped as white. So a strange knight on a4, undeveloped pieces, but you have a piece up. You will need to develop your pieces as quickly as possible. There are many moves in this position. One of them is rook b1. And the idea is that after bishop a6, which is the strategic move that every French player will know that they need this move, that's the bad bishop in the French defense. You want to get rid of it. And after queen takes a6, you see that this queen is annoying. It doesn't allow us to castle. So yeah, you need quite some regrouping here. You need to somehow manage to castle and you need to somehow manage to not have this knight on a4 anymore. And uh, you need priorities. So first knight f3 was played, which is a good move. You threaten the d4 pawn and you also place your knight in a nicer square. f3 is fine. After knight c5, knight b2 is bringing back his knight and gives up the a2 pawn, but it means that now either you can take on d4 or what I would suggest, and it happened in the game, castle. <laughs> castle as quick as you can and then take the pawn on d4. It's not running away. So right now, black has four pawns, four, for the piece. But we are taking back one, the d4 pawn. And what this position will be after capturing on d4, well, it's still unclear. White must be better, but how much of an advantage it is, it could be a big advantage if it wasn't for the clumsy pieces. The clumsy knight we had on a4 is now a clumsy knight on b2. What is that arrow pointing from b2 to f1? I have no idea. So as long as, long as you have clumsy pieces, the opponent has compensation. Um, here black made a slight mistake. Queen a6 was played and that's too passive. If you are material down, now we are, we are giving advice to the player that has less material, if you want to compensate for the lack of a piece, for instance, if you are an exchange down or if you have pawns for a piece, yes, number wise is the same, but your pawns are not advanced. So this position is supposed to be worse for black and it is worse, but you need to compensate for it with active pieces, active play. Do not go backwards unless you are forced to. You will need to be as active as possible if you want to compensate for a material down. Queen a6, therefore, not the right move because it's going too passive. So, ah, oh, I was too quick. I wanted you to figure out what's the move. And I've just shown it. Knight d1. Ah, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I was... I was going to ask you how to activate the b2 knight, but I'm sure you would have said it. I was not supposed to show it. So yeah, this was a brilliant move in the game. <laughs> Where are we heading? We are heading towards c3, b5, d6. Either the b5 square or the d6 square. Those are great for the knight. Definitely not the b2 square. So this is, this is something that if you remember one thing from today's lesson, that should be this. If you are material up and because of winning material, your pieces are clumsy, make sure that you take time to reorganize your pieces. It's going to take moves. It's going to take time on the chessboard. It's, it can take two, three, five, seven. I don't know how many moves. It can take many moves depending on how, how clumsy those pieces are but take time to regroup them this knight is coming from a4 went to b2 now to d1 none of those squares are great right it's temporary but you need to make those moves in order to get to great places like the b5 square so it's gonna take us a long journey to get there to d6 even longer but it is worth it. Once you manage to activate your pieces and once you have everything nicely organized in harmony on the chessboard, then you will be winning. Now, right now, this is just a piece up, just a material advantage. It's gonna be a real advantage if you have all your pieces happy, all your pieces active. Take time to regroup your pieces. So that's what happened in the game. Just always double check that you're not blundering so there's no nothing you're not losing the knight on c3 and uh, of course you should always improve your other pieces so why not take the a file 
And now knight b5, double attack, a7 pawn hanging, knight d6 is a threat. So once we have activated our pieces, you see that black's position collapses. We are getting at least a pawn, and that will leave him with just two pawns for the piece. But last question in this game, what would you play here after queen c6? Knight takes a7 or something else. You have these suggestions. Shall we take the pawn now or shall we do something else? Let's see. What do you think about it? Where's my time to think? Time to think. Oh my. Time to think. I've got my mouse trapped. This time it was Easy Rider 27 who guessed it first and I seen that Game of Pawns is also suggesting the same move. Now the Drunken Lawyer says Knight FD4. That is the correct solution. Uh, let's just first see why not Knight takes A7. So many of you realize that Knight, knight takes A7 is not a good move. So you are all right about not Knight takes A7. The Knight is hanging on B5 so it's very tempting to take a pawn with this hanging piece, right? Why not take it? Well, the reason is. The reason is that we have suffered so long, it has taken us so much time to make this clumsy A4 knight a good piece. And now we are throwing it out. We have just played knight takes A7, which is not a losing move, but why? Why to do that to our knight? Yes, we have captured the pawn. Yes, he only has two pawns for the piece. But what is our knight doing on a7? Nothing. It's gonna take us ages. It's gonna take us sweat to get this knight back into play. So why? Why bother? Do not ever consider moves like this. And congratulations everybody because nobody said knight takes a7. So this just a general advice. These ugly moves are ugly for a reason. Unless you capture a rook on a7 or a piece for free, do not place your knight there. What is it doing there? Nothing. The pawn will not go away. So we will capture the pawn, but we are not in a rush. This is a general rule that we should add for today's lesson as well. As number four, you are not in a rush. So whether uh, defending the rook, uh, defending the rook, defending the knight with the rook move. I was going to say like, I, I think Jen suggested rook f b1. That's also a good move. But if you can protect the knight and attack at the same time, so you win tempo by playing knight f d4, that's even better because you make sure that after the queen moves, you have time to take the pawn. So that's the only reason why knight f d4 is better than rook b1 is that it's a tempo. So whenever you can defend something, and win a tempo, do it. These knights work beautifully together. Next move, rook takes a7 and black resign because even though he still has two pawns for the piece, those pawns are paralyzed. We've got all these beautiful pieces. The rook on the seventh, the knights working together perfectly. The other rook can come to the c5. So we have everything we could ask for a piece up and beautifully placed pieces. This is indeed a completely winning position. I understand that black resigned. Hope that you remember the main points from this game. 
especially that this is a line where Black sacrifices on purpose a piece for three pawns and what he has is compensation. But this compensation only works if he keeps on playing active. So passive moves when you are material down will not help you. It's just gonna make things worse. worse. And now <laughs> this maneuver that I revealed without asking you, oops, beautiful knight coming from a4 to b2 to d1 then c3 b5 and we win we win once we carry out this maneuver we have some more positions to see so let me show you another game with the same opening i love the french defense but i chose these games because it leads to once again a piece versus three pawns and we will see a different version of it bishop d3 you remember the previous game was with rook b1 here but this is not about theory just to you see that the difference will be that after bishop a6 you do not want to take it because then it means you have just thrown away a temple so knight b2 and now if your opponent has a clumsy piece the knight on b2 is clumsy do not help your opponent so in this position as black bishop takes d3 is not something that you want to do you don't want this knight to be improved make white suffer with the knight on b2 do not activate his pieces that's a suggestion for black so knight c5 is a great move threatening to take on d3 so white has to do something about it and now once again this annoying queen right never let us castle but i'm sure you know the answer how you will manage to castle you need to play Queen e2. And this is once again a position where you need to know your priorities. Yes, you have a clumsy knight on b2. Red one, not green. You have a clumsy knight on b2 and you have a king in the middle of the board. Which one is more important? The king is more important. So first we forget about the b2 knight. That's in brackets. Second step. First, you manage to castle, then you care about the b2 knight. And the way to castle is, of course, by playing queen e2. You're not scared of trading queens, so queen e2 is a great move. You want to get rid of the queens with a piece up on the board. And if the opponent pushes d3, all right, you go away with the queen and next move you castle. Anything that closes this diagonal that's obstructing your castling, that is fine. Queen e2 and after queen a3, which is not a good move because it allows queen b5 check. Not only protects the b2 knight with a check, but it forces black to be a bit awkward. I mean, either knight d7 or king e7. It's not like the king is too bad here in this position on e7 because the e file, the f file and the d file are closed. So it's not too bad, but might it might end up in trouble on the long run. So it, it, it is always a good idea not to play automatic moves. This knight is hanging, find a way to defend it with an active move, queen b5 check, and then you castle. This is already a beautiful position. We are not losing a piece with queen a3, don't worry, rook f2 saves everything. There's no knight jump that would win the rook. Luckily, <laughs> luckily none of these move, moves win, so that's why we could allow queen e3 check. Now, there are several moves, but once again, clumsy pieces. We are a piece up, but this position is not even advantageous until you find a way to reorganize your pieces. So you can think about how you would do it in this position. There are many ways to do it, but you need to find one of those ways in your own games. Always make sure that you do not leave your pieces as clumsy as this one. Of course, it's not only about the knight because your rook is not developed and your other rook is pinned so you have plenty of things to solve but once you solve all of them your position might be a really nice advantage but why did here was rook d1 you can go rook f1 you can go knight f1 depends on what is your plan but do have a plan to regroup your pieces rook d1 is one of them and after g6 knight f1 this was white's idea after that he wants to take the d4 pawn queen a3 and rook takes d4 so black right now has only two pawns for the piece but we still have 
a really weird night on B2. The other knight is not good either on F1. And uh, <laughs> we have just dropped another pawn. Yeah, so we took the D4 pawn, but black, of course, can take the A2 pawn. So what I said about the two pawns was not true. I cannot count. Right now, it's three pawns and our pieces are clumsy. So this position is unclear. It's not even a, an advantage for white, maybe a slight advantage. But this position, with such clumsy pieces and without any harmony between your pieces, it is equal. Equal even with not much advanced pawns. So three pawns for black, but they are not advanced. Imagine black manages to advance his pawns. That would mean he could even be winning this game if you do not regroup your pieces. So make sure that you do that because you can even lose the game if you do not care about your pieces. Um, Queen B3 was interesting that the black is uh, the one that wants to trade pieces here. Now the reason is the following. Who has a weaker king? Black. So yes, sometimes it is, it is the other way. I told you not to always take my words literally. If the opponent's king is weaker, he doesn't want you to have a queen. He doesn't want to get mated. Also, without the queens on the board, it's very likely that black would just start pushing these pass pawns, the A and B pawn, connected pass pawns. He's got connected pass pawns. And that could be an advantage in an end game. Connected pass pawns could be extremely strong if he manages to push them. Also in the middle game, of course, but as long as his king is in danger on E7, he can't really think about pushing pawns. He should think about the safety of his king. So that's why queen b3 is very logical for black. And that's why it's very logical to keep the queen on the board in this position. The opponent's king is weaker than yours. You should keep the queens on the board. And now, before I once again spoil everything, how do you activate the b2 knight? You don't want to leave it there. Whether it's moving it right now or next move, but tell me what is the plan? Where do you want to place this knight and how do you carry it out? Time to spend. Good job, I see game of pawns suggesting knight d1, knight e3, knight g4, knight f6. Let me draw that because that, that would be a beautiful drink. Drunken lawyer is saying the same. Um, so you guys are right. Let me show this route. This is one of the solutions. You can go knight d1, knight e3, and from e3, already on e3 it's much better than on b2. But if you wanna go further, if you need to go further, then knight g4, knight f6 could be a possibility, but for now, having it on e3 would already be a huge improvement. Another solution is the one that was played in the game, which is that you would like to have your knight on d3. And yeah, sorry, I think that's what the drunken lawyer suggested. So you would like to have your knight on d3, which is just one move away. Why not go there right now? Uh, because it's not harmonious. So yeah, from a clumsy plea, please. From a clumsy piece, yeah, managed. From a clumsy piece, we make another clumsy. 
Oh, today I'm revealing all the solutions without wanting to. Mm. So, from a clumsy piece. That is the B2 knight. By playing knight d3 immediately, we make another clumsy piece. Do not do that to your pieces. You want your pieces to feel happy, to be in harmony. This is not harmony, having a rook on d4 and the knight on d3. What is the knight doing? I mean, the knight is doing fine, but the rook is doing weird on d4. Yeah, maybe next move could be rook b4 and such, but why to have the rook there in the first place? So before you do this to your rook, think about it. Think about knight d3, your rook will be weird. You do not want to do you do not want to do that. That's why the term retreating move has been invented. Sometimes you need to go backwards. It's not only forwards, it's not only attack, it's not only about launching, storming forward, but sometimes you need to go backwards with your pieces if you know why you do it. <laughs> do not go backwards just for the sake of going backwards. Rook D1 is a very strong move because it is for the reason to improve your knight. You want to play knight d3 next move and that is that is what's gonna happen. Doesn't matter what black does, you play knight d3 and you already have a much nicer position. It still doesn't look that active, right? But your rook is not weird. Um, the knight is much better on d3. So you have improved it. It's still not perfect, of course, but step by step. So be patient. Number four, rule number four of today. Be patient. After rook a c8, another retreating move, rook f to f1, and the reason is that the rook was, the rook is on f2. Well, the rook was on f2 for a reason. Remember when we got a check, queen e3 check, and then rook f2 happened, but that was long ago, <laughs> and now, right now, the rook is not doing much on f2. You could say that it's protecting the second rank, but do we need to protect the second rank? Actually, if we allow black to play rook c2, that only helps us because we want to go with the queen forward. We want to threaten queen g5 check, queen h4 check. This is great for us. Why to prevent rook c2 when it only helps us? So the rooks on the back rank looks like once again we are playing passive moves, but it makes sense. We are starting to place our pieces in harmony, the rooks are connected, so you can go away with your queen, you can go anywhere with your queen because the rook on d1 will not be hanging. And the, the d3 knight, well, it will find its way, but after simply after rook c2, you know that you can go away with the queen. And if he keeps the heavy pieces on the third rank, then we will find a way to activate the queen. Uh, I don't know if you hear David sneezing, by the way, the Spanish director of Chess24, he is here, of course, uh, in Madrid, and he's got a cold. So uh, send your regards to David and your get well wishes. He is, yeah, he's been sneezing the whole afternoon. Anyway, in this position, what happened was a5. That's very logical, right? Black has connected pass pawns on the queen side. He should push those pawns if he wants to compensate those pawns on the third rank, for instance, would be a real danger already. Do not let that happen. You need a plan. You need to be quick this time. This time, patience doesn't work because you see those pawns marching forward. Uh, that's what happened in Kramnik's game, the first game that we saw in all these series that was under the name Material Imbalances. Go back to that very first session if you want to see what I'm talking about with the pawns marching forward against Pantala Hari Krishna. So that is what we do not want. When you have a piece up, don't just sit back, relax, and wait until the opponent promotes one of his pawns. No, now you need to act. You have, you have regrouped your pieces, and now you need to improve them further. How can we improve the d3 knight further? Let me see how many creative chess players we have here. How do you activate that knight? Time to think.
I think I've seen the solution by drunken lawyer. This was a difficult one. It's not a usual move and it's not seen immediately why it is a good move. But the strongest move in this position is... No, I will not say it yet. <laughs> Rook C1 was the other, the other suggestion, not solution. Um, yes, I told you to trade pieces, but also be careful about trading in the wrong way because, for instance, after trading everything on the back rank, yes, we have traded the rooks, but now the knight is clumsy. And I don't want to be pinned on the back rank. It means that now we need to do something about this pin knight. We will have to protect it with the queen. And in the meantime, black will be marching forward with his pawn. This is getting real dangerous. Don't do this. Don't you, you don't want to do this. So while on the other hand, we learned that we should aim to trade pieces. On the other hand, you don't, you don't want to have badly placed pieces. So rook c1, yes, trading pieces, but no because of getting clumsy pieces on the board. And I have seen that clumsy piece is the word of the day. Very funny. So rook c1 is not the best because it would make your knight a clumsy piece. Uh, secondly, remember that in this position, another factor that we are dealing with is the king on e7. We want to get access to this king. And we have seen some sessions uh, we had sessions on the king in the middle of the board. If you missed them, please check them there on YouTube. So when you want to attack a king in the middle of the board, you need to open the position. You need to get access to that king. So that is what we are going to do right now. Even with the piece up, you should not forget about the other guidelines that we have talked about. If the opponent's king is in the middle of the board, you should somehow make sure that you get there. You need open you need to open the position and you need to open sometimes you just need to open squares for your pieces you want your knight to go to f4 and that's where the pawn was so we sacrificed this pawn now black has four pawns for the piece four but suddenly we have really dangerous knights these knights are going for the king and the king on a7 is suddenly not as safe as it used to be finally we will be able to move the queen as well so in this position um any move even pushing the a pawn or rook c5 i'm not sure why rook c5 was played um but anyway none of these moves help because we will bring the queen as well now we have the knights and the queen going for the black king on e7 and this position is lost. It doesn't matter what black does. He can even take a fifth pawn for the moment because we can take on h7 if we want, but we don't care about pawns anymore. This is not about how many pawns who has, it's about who can give mate. And we are attacking the black king, so we shall be the one who gives mate. What would you do after king d7? Attacking the king in the middle of the board. Let's see who remembers that lesson or who is strong enough to suggest the winning solution in this position how to keep on attacking the black king time to think and time to find my mouse there it is Well done, everybody. I see that Miss Tactics has done a great job. I mean, I knew that she has done a great job, but I see the effect. You guys are so sharp, tactically. You solve everything like this in a second. So lots of tactics training with Miss Tactics. I see that. Also, you might be using the tactics trainer on Chess24. Anything you do in order to improve your calculation and your tactical vision is great. So proud of you guys because it's not only about strategy, strategy and tactics go hand in hand. You know that we are best friends with Sopico and we complement each other. The way it happens on the chessboard, you need to know your tactics as well in order to 
crush the opponent in the right moment, you need to hit right now. Knight takes f5, sacrificing the piece. Sometimes having material advantage is good because you can give it back. Now, this is this is not something that normally happens that you give up the piece for a pawn, especially when black has four, four or five, <laughs> five pawns for the piece. But here it's because the black king is in trouble. He cannot take this because if he does, check after king d7, queen f6 wins the piece back and the attack still goes on. So the king will be getting mated on those open fights in the center. That's why this cannot happen after knight takes f5, black went knight c6. Now, who can continue the attack the way Miss Tactics would do it? You've got a few seconds to tell me what is the solution here. Miss Tactics, Miss Tactics, Miss Tactics. Brilliant. Once again, tactical solution immediately in the chat. Everybody's saying knight takes e6. That is so great. That is the solution. Beautiful move. It can be taken either with a pawn or with the king. None of them works. Let's just see why. Knight takes e6, crushing the opponent. This king on d7 will be mated. If f takes, you just go queen g7, and after king d8, Knight d4 retreating move once again. Sometimes these retreating moves can be the most powerful. You attack the queen and you threaten mate on f8. This is 1 0. So if king takes, and that's what happened in the game, you just simply give a check with the rook that was not doing that much on d1. And you keep giving checks. This is a beautiful one to start with because it can be taken. But if it's taken, it's going to be made. If it's not taken, it's still going to be made. You can analyze this position if you do not believe me. There are many variations, but in all of them, black gets mated. So it doesn't matter what he does. He even resigned in this position because after knight d8, knight d6, you have to move the king and queen takes d8. This is made in a few moves. That was a beautiful finish to a game that was not looking that much of an advantage. So remember that this is coming from a variation where black sacrifices a piece for three pawns, and this is theory, theory, this is theory, this is theory. And um, it means that these positions are really complicated with both colors to play. So black has compensation for this piece, uh, but this queen a3 was a mistake. It's slightly dubious to allow queen b5 check. And after that, simply all that white needed to do was to regroup his pieces. And this is something you should learn from today. So let's just sum up what we have checked in this game, what we studied. What are these guidelines? When you win a piece, we've gonna go through these four or five guidelines. Uh, when you have material advantage, it's likely that you will end up in a position where your pieces are not so well placed, clumsy. Like in this position, the b2 knight, the f2 rook and the a1 rook, they are all weird and not working in harmony. You want harmonious pieces, you want happy pieces on the board. So it will take time for you to maneuver and activate these pieces, but you must take time and do that. You cannot just leave your pieces like this. That is not a piece advantage. If you keep the knight on b2, you will never win this game. Believe me. So first of all, regroup your pieces, make them active. It's gonna take time, it might take retreating moves, it might take passive moves, but you need to regroup your pieces, place them in an ideal position. You should figure out, you need a plan, and you need to know how you want to place them and then carry it out. Secondly, trades of pieces are good for you in general, but trades of pieces, the emphasis on pieces, not pawns. Number Rule number three of today, if you have a piece for pawns, 
or any similar scenario where you have less pawns than the opponent, do not trade pawns. You need pawns if in an endgame you end up playing with a knight, with an extra knight, you need pawns on the board, otherwise it might be a theoretical draw. So keep the pawns on the board, trade pieces. Trade pieces if they are equally active. Do not trade queens if the opponent's king is not safe, like in this game. Fourth guideline of today was to be patient. And that in chess is a general rule that you need to be patient if you have a positional advantage. But number five, <laughs> if you see that the opponent starts pushing past pawns, connected past pawns, for instance, uh, an A and B pawn that could have happened later in this game, remember the position where it suddenly looked dangerous. The A and B pawns, if they start marching, you're gonna be in trouble. So you don't always have time to be that patient. Of course, you should carefully plan how you're gonna, how you're gonna proceed, but you need to act. When the opponent has such an easy plan that is pushing, pushing and pushing his pass pawns, you need to act quickly. You cannot just sit back and wait until he promotes his pawns. So yes, patience is needed, but sometimes there are positions like these ones when the opponent has passed pawns that you need to act before it's too late, before he advances his pawns too much. Advanced pawns can compensate for a piece much easier than such backward pawns as the a7 and b6 pawns. So these are the guidelines that you should learn from today. I hope that you found this session an instructive one and you have learned something, you have remembered some of those guidelines and you will try to practice them in your games because you should of course, always practice this. Do not just let it sit uh, in the back of your brain. Whenever you play games, please think of the guidelines. Please think of my tips and my suggestions to you because you need to practice these thoughts. Otherwise, you will not improve. You need to practice everything that you learn, whether it's tactics, strategy, end games, openings, anything you learn, make sure that you practice them. You can practice online by playing, for instance, Band of Blitz right now. I mean, right now in 22 minutes, Miss Tactics will start her session. So make sure that you join her in 22 minutes here on chess24.com. She will be playing Band of Blitz. That is that you can challenge her and she will be commentating on the games and on how you can improve your chess because she always gives really nice advice to her opponents. So make sure that you tune in in 22 minutes here on Chess24. I will be watching also this, this show of Miss Tactics because I myself can learn a lot from her. See you guys next week. Bye bye.